Watching the world burn, watching the world burn. September 29th, 2024. Let's get into it. I always try to help you out in these videos and talk about things that might be relevant to you before we get into geopolitics. And uh, I was just fishing around. And of course, I'm always interested in Florida real estate. I'm hoping that uh, once silver hits about $100 an ounce, uh, and the dollar is practically worthless that maybe I can go out and buy some real estate. Uh, you know, I'm real interested in those. Well, we're, let's get into that in just a minute. So the first thing I wanted to, to uh, get you on to was uh, ReVenture. I was just found this as a channel. I, I, I'm not even subscribed to it, but I love this video. It says uh, ReVenture Consulting, if you want to watch them on YouTube. And uh, the title of the video is Florida is Becoming Uninhabitable. And I... Uh, you know, before I get into my discussion of the topic, let's watch that video right away. Petersburg, Florida, and I'm going to show you what homeowners here are now having to deal with after Hurricane Helene. We're talking five, six feet of water that got into people's houses, complete destruction. They're having to throw out all the interior contents. They're having to move out. And I think it's really important for you all watching out there to understand the reality of what's going on in Florida right now with these extreme weather events and the risks that you run buying a home in certain locations in Florida. And this is a good example of what happened here the other night with the hurricane. You could see this house, it's this white house. I want you to pay attention to the line, that brown line on the house there. That's how high the water levels rose to. So that's out about four, four and a half feet on the house. From the street, it's probably six, seven feet this house was for sale and it just got completely flooded. You can see there's a swing in the front yard. Clearly kids live here. Uh, it's a family that lives here. And this is the devastation that's occurring here in Florida. And this was a neighborhood, Shore Acres, that was already having issues before this hurricane. The inventory of homes for sale had spiked up to 230 homes because a year ago during Hurricane Idalia, Half of the homes in Shore Acres flooded. Lots of people had to sell. Demand went down, inventory went way up. Well, now another hurricane has come and hit. And home prices here, I talked to some of the locals, they think the prices are gonna drop even further. And it's a shame because this is actually a really beautiful neighborhood. I commented on this the last time I was here. Really idyllic, really, really nice. But it's at a very low elevation level. And so, when there's a hurricane that causes a big storm surge, which is what happened during Helene, the storm surge goes to eight, uh, eight feet, nine feet. We're only at like four feet above sea level here. Five feet above sea level, so that means houses get flooded. But now if you look at this house over here, you can tell it didn't get hit as bad because it's up from the street, goes up and then has a porch. So the water didn't come up as high. And the reason I'm pointing out these specifics on elevation is because if you're a home buyer in Florida, you really have to pay attention to the elevation of your house. A couple feet can be the difference between your house gets flooded, you need to move everything out and do repairs in a complete remodel versus you do okay and it's not that bad. Now here's another house, everyone just across the street again. You can see the water line on the garage up four feet, five feet which again from the street means the water was up seven or eight feet. You could tell that this house was also on the market. As a sign says, newly remodeled. The for sale sign is actually washed away. You could see it, you could see it down there. But I, I want you folks to think about this. Like last night, the water was up to the newly remodeled poster right there. It was up to that level. Okay, so you know what he was talking about there was Obviously, you know, in Florida, for example, I live in central Florida. I'm only 89 feet above sea level. And, uh, and I've done a lot of things uh, to my house. Like I've put in coastal windows at a cost of $50,000. Uh, a lot of these renovations to make your house uh, more durable. Uh, you know, I've heard of metal roofs, but because of my roof, if you ever buy a house, I mean, if you, if you want to put on a metal roof, you get, you know, just a roof that just has one you know, peak. My house, you know, because of the way they made it, it has multiple peaks. And when I priced out putting a metal roof on there, it was, it was, they said, no, nah, we just can't do it. There's too many different angles for us to put the metal shingles on. So I had to go with a shingled roof, which 
will only last uh, maybe 15 years. And uh, by the way, there's a, a something I'm going to look into is called re reconditioning the roof. Um, but I, I just wanted to talk about alternate construction for just a minute because we need to rethink, you know, how we're doing our construction here in the United States. Just just a little bit. So, uh, you know. One of the things I always loved was an earth home. So if you lived in like Oklahoma or one of these tornado alleys, uh, you know, it normally makes sense is you build the, 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 ho the house into the ground or you bring the ground up over top of the house. They're like living like a hobbit, right? And, uh, and you could literally drive a freaking truck over top of the house. And the dirt also gives you geothermal uh, capabilities to, to heat and cool the house. So your utilities are, are dirt or nothing, but nobody builds earth homes, and they're, they're really hard to find, and I don't understand why uh, we can't do that. Of course, Elon Musk, now we've got the tiny homes. I mean, you understand that uh, a tiny home or a modular constructed home that, that is built in a factory is a lot better than a stick-built house, because it has to withstand that transportation, so they have to reinforce the walls, and because it's built in a factory, it never suffers any weather damage, and so hopefully, as long as the people working in the factory are somewhat decent, uh, you know, you're going to get a very good home. And then, of course, if you're going to buy a house that you want to have a view of the ocean or you want to be in one of these communities uh, that's only four feet above sea level or whatever, uh, do what uh, 100 years ago, there was a huge, huge hurricane uh, in Texas. Uh, that was back before, you know, we had predictions about hurricanes and everything. And I mean thousands of people died. Uh, it, it just wiped everything off of the island. And so then uh, uh, a lot of people moved back in and, and stupidly just built the same stick-built houses. Well, there was four people that uh, they said, no, no, we're not doing that. And they, they built these. And it really doesn't cost that much extra. So let's say that a normal house costs $200,000, okay? If you're going to build a stick-built house and, and reinforce it properly with uh, coastal windows and everything, you might be putting an extra 50000 into the house. That's nothing, man, for construction costs. And I'm telling you, uh, so th there was four houses there. They were built on these huge stilts. They had all of the, the latest uh, and greatest stuff to survive the hurricane. And there was another hurricane that came through, wiped everything out again, except those four houses. Those four houses were left standing. So what I'm saying is if we're ever going to get control of insurance rates and everything, we need to rethink how we're building houses in, in the United States. And uh, the other thing was I wanted to talk about, and I, I think the term that he used in the video, it's called bear, going bear. I never heard of that. And I was telling you in previous videos about how uh, homeowners insurance here in Florida has gone through the roof. And, uh, and so I was thinking about self-insuring, and he said it's called going bear. So I'm going bare. <clears throat> I don't see any reason now that I've uh, reinforced the windows and I've put in a security system and everything else in the house. I, you know, I, and I, 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 my parents, like I said, they, they went 30 years and only made one homeowner's claim. You know, so I'm, I'm not going to pay these exorbitant prices on homeowner's insurance. And right now, citizen's insurance, another thing he pointed out in the video, is going broke. All right, so enough on real estate, uh, I, but I'm just telling you, and you can't go bare until you pay off your mortgage. And I've been telling you, pay down your debt. Uh, we did the, the gold, uh, silver, platinum, palladium theme yesterday. Uh, all right, so let's start with something fun. I was going to get into uh, uh, Hezbollah and the serious geopolitical stuff, but I tell you what, I, I told you I had extra footage on Roseanne Barr, and, uh, and this is Tucker Carlson, and so this kind of picks up where the video yesterday left off with Roseanne Barr, she is a treasure to this nation. Let's watch that video. The epidemic in America is child sexual abuse, and I just want people to see it. I want people to open up their eyes and see how prevalent and horrible it is. One of three girls, one of four boys in this country today. It's just horrible, and uh, you just can't la, la, la it away anymore. It's going to get more and more apparent, and you got to choose your side. We, you know what I said? When they, did, when they didn't pass that safe law, boy, am I getting mad. 
Do you know Tucker? Tucker, I'm, I better shut up. No. Do you know how many people I had? Do you know what I do? Do you know what I've done since they stole that election in 2020? They gave us a goddamn COVID so we'd send in those mail order ballots and all that bullshit and the post office cheated too. Everybody in this country cheated us out of our president in 2020. They made us sick. They, I'm sorry. Go baby. Overthrew the United States of America. They overthrew the Constitutional Republic of the United States of America. And then they covered it up with their January 6th bullshit. Because the first thing President Trump did, God bless that man, and I love him, and everybody knows it. I love him more now than I ever loved him, and I loved him pretty damn good. He drove me out in a Bentley when I did my second HBO special at Trump Palace in um, Atlantic City, if you've seen it. He's always been a good friend and a good man. And to me, and to a lot of other people. And, uh, what was I saying? <laughs> I'm old. I forget what I'm saying. What was I saying? Well, I wasn't kidding about Roseanne being interesting, was I? I mean... No, I'm sorry. No, I can't it's help. true. I, I forgot what I was saying. You said they overthrew Trump. Yeah. They used... the. COVID. Yeah, they made and then up January COVID. January 6th. They got a... Fauci gave everybody AIDS, too. Did you know that? He did. Google it. He withheld the AIDS treatment from dying people and came back to give us COVID. And he's working on a whole new one. Nobody stops any of these people. How come the same people are still around? The ones with the fake Pfizer's and Obama, this is his fourth goddamn term. How come nobody does anything about Obama and he's still running around? After Fast and Furious, after fake Pfizer's, they overthrew the government of our country and they haven't even answered for it. And that pisses me off. what I was going to say. You guys, since they did that, Tucker, I'm sorry. But so, since they did that. No, no, sorry. I had someone cheering backstage. Was, uh, yeah. No, I have been on the phone. You guys would not even believe how many people I have called. Every day I am on the phone and I'm causing trouble every single place I can, wall to wall, coast to coast. I am. You are the best. <laughs> because you know why? Because you know how Trump says they're not after me, they're after you, and I'm just in their way. You know how Trump says that? Well, they're not after America. They're after the world, and America's the only thing that stands in their way. That is true. If they take America, they'll take the whole damn world. Every kid in it. I'm here for the kids. I'm here for the kids. I'm a grandmother. 
everybody says, you raised me. You know, a lot of people come up and they go, you know, I am the woman I am today because you raised me. And I go, don't blame me that you're a hoe. <laughs> because a lot of them, I don't want to take credit. But, but I just feel like I'm... <laughs> No, but I feel like I am a grandma, and uh, to these people, they say, you know, you raised me, and now my kids watch you. Well, that means something to me, and um, I never would take that for granted. I never would. It means something to me, and uh, and so I want to, you know how uh, Trump, we have MAGA and then RFK, uh, we have... We have Maha, Make America Healthy Again. Isn't it great? Well, I'm launching one. Uh, make America Moral Again. <laughs> and it's called Mama. And what that means is no more double standards, America. No more double standards anywhere because that means you don't have no standards. One law for everybody. Amen. And since I am like in the position to be America's grandmother now, by God, I'm going to do it. You know, I, I don't know why this is from my act. But I do try to correct children when I see, you know, their parents don't even watch them these days. And so, you know, I, I will step in when I see. I do. I have to. And I challenge all other grandparents you just have to, uh, you probably can't get away with it like I can. But, you know, I just have to do it. I'm a, just a nosy old woman, and I feel like God wants me to do it. He wants me to do it like these kids were screaming in the hall in my hotel, you know. And, uh, no, but I do do this, and my son said, you better stop it, mother, because someone's going to sue you. All right, so that's Roseanne Barr, eight minutes. I mean, I, I hope I'm not stealing too much material from Tucker Carlson, but I mean, go watch Tucker Carlson. I mean, he's got great, great interviews. Uh, and she just did an interview. I'm not going to put up any video about it, but with Glenn Beck. And it's a hell of an interview. And uh, and she was talking about, you know, yesterday, you know, we were talking about child trafficking, uh, 300,000 kids that are missing in the United States, uh, pedophilia, sat satanic uh, uh, the occult, uh, but uh, you know, Roseanne just put it in two words: hate evil. You got to hate evil if you're going to be a good person. God tells you to hate evil. He doesn't say, uh, you know, embrace uh, your neighbor uh, if they're a satanic uh, pedophile lunatic. He says, hate evil. So hate evil. Uh, this is a brief video on uh, because I wanted to follow up with Roseanne. Uh, this is a, a black pastor talking about how black people might want to consider voting for Trump. The things I want to say, I'm Pastor David Lowry, Universal Baptist Church. One of the things that I want to say is this, to the American people and patriots across this country, black people have been with the Democratic Party for over 60 years, and we have nothing. We don't own anything in our community. We have no schools. There's no businesses in the black community. All we have is crime and problems. So as a pastor, I'm standing up here with Bob Ferretti and some of the other black leaders. The truth of the matter is this. Why should black people keep voting for the Democrats when they don't have nothing? We need to understand this. We need to go and take a look at the Republican Party, but the Republican Party needs to be visual and need to do things in the black community. If we do that, we can make the change. We already know the Democrats are not going to do nothing. I'm the grandson of Eloise Barton the second lady ever elected to the city council of Chicago, 16 ward. And now what we see, 
there's nothing that the Democrats have done or will they do across this country for black people but use us. So why not black people? Let us give the Republicans a chance to show what they can do for our communities as well. Have Republicans done that or are you still searching? No, there's no search. The Republicans have reached out to a lot of the black leaders like myself, Brother Carter, Paul McKinley, and we've sat down with them and we started to talk. I've been talking to Mr. Porter and some of the other leaders on how we can start getting together. But let this be clear. As a contractor for the Heritage Foundation during the primary season, we sent teams out to the polling places in the black community. And we found exactly what President Trump was talking about. We found thumb drives. We found the printers. We found Democratic judges who was posing as Republican judges. So it's the polls that's being inundated with the cheating. We have receipts for everything I've said. I also saw in those polling places where the Democrats were telling people that there are no, no Republican ballots. There's so many things going on in these polling places in the black community, and that's how the Democrats are able to keep and say Chicago is blue. But actually, if the polling places were straight, black people would have an opportunity to vote for whom they choose, not whom they told to. And if the polling places aren't straight, they'll try to steal another election like they did in 2020. So that's one. All right, so that was a, just a brief video there. The next one I want to get into is, uh, this is Stefan Gardner. And uh, if you don't follow him on, um, on uh, you can follow him on Rumble, and he's also on YouTube. Uh, and, you know, by the way, he's on the Ukraine death list. <laughs> and it was funny because the guy he was interviewing, he goes, that's a hell of an accomplishment. He says, it means that you've made a mark. Uh, so I, I, I don't know if I'm on the Ukraine death list. Nobody's told me that I am. So let, let's, let, I hope not. I mean, and he, he said, you know, I don't like being on that list. I said, yeah, I, I can totally agree. But the thing I like about Stefan Gardner is um, I, he presents both perspectives, and I want to do the same uh, with my videos. And uh, so this is a, it's the, the title of the video, Former CIA Expresses Kamala's Biggest Mistake. Now, I don't know why he titled the video that, because it, to me it went into much more important topics. And so the two that I wanted to show you was he talked about the election, because that's my biggest concern is, is how the Democrats are going to cheat on the election or the deep state. And, uh, and then also it was a different perspective. So, so we're going to get into the Israeli perspective of the war with uh, Yemen, Hezbollah, and Hamas. Okay, and of course, eventually now I think Iran. Uh, there's some, uh, we might make another video. There's a lot of posts out that says Iran said, you know, you, like I said, you just got to take all this in and you don't know what to believe and what not, uh, which is why I want to give you the Israeli perspective. I gave you the Hezbollah perspective yesterday. All right, so now we're going to go, but, uh, um, but they're saying Iran is, is going to send troops. Uh, now, if they sent troops, it'd probably be just logistical support to Hezbollah. I don't know. Uh, they're saying, I saw some other tweets, that Hezbollah has declared war on Israel. I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, we do know that the leader of Hezbollah was killed. Now, I did get some more information on uh, what took place there, because I told you there were multiple 2,000-pound drums, but I, bombs dropped. Uh, but there was a picture on X that, of this huge crater. So Lord Bebo said that he was 30 feet underground, and so the Israelis had to hit that area multiple times with th these 2,000 pound bunker busting bombs to get down to 30 feet to kill him. So if you're for killing him, I guess that, that, you know, they're showing their capabilities. I mean, if you get down 30 feet to kill somebody, and so he was underground. A lot of people think he was up in that apartment building. No, he wasn't. And uh, so let's, uh, let's watch the uh, Stefan Gardner video right now. This man has no money. Uh, according to FBI reports, and uh, somehow he's able to travel to Ukraine, back to the United States, to Hawaii, back to the United States, somehow makes his way to Florida with an illegal weapon as a felon, uh, knows exactly where Donald Trump will be so that he can hide and uh, potentially take out the former president. Now, just this morning, I'm reading that his son has been arrested for having pornography of young children what the heck is going on with this guy? And then is the FBI going to actually pursue him as the criminal that he is? Or is Ron DeSantis of Florida 
going to have to step in and, and level heavier charges. Well, you've got to really ha- hand it to Ron DeSantis for doing a great job by stepping in like this because the FBI special agent in charge of the Miami field office who's running the FBI investigation was such a crazed Trump hater that he had to have his social media scrubbed of his anti-Trump rants as a senior FBI person. This You're not supposed to be political in the FBI, but he was. Then before he's named special agent in charge, he scrubs everything. So <clears throat> a lot of guys in the FBI, <clears throat> excuse me, have have raised this. They knew him. And, and, and to have somebody like that in charge of the investigation, you simply cannot trust not just FBI headquarters, but the Miami field office on an investigation like this. So this is where the states need to assert themselves like DeSantis has been doing in Florida to say, you know what, feds, get out of the way. This is our state. The crime was committed here. We don't trust you. We're taking the lead on this investigation. And that's the other thing too. The FBI always has to hog the lead on any investigation that happens in any state. And you look at their news releases and their Twitter X posts, they're constantly claiming credit for things they had little or nothing to do with. It's just because they went in to intervene to take credit away from the local authorities. But in this case, FBI is taking the clues and the evidence away from the local authorities. Mm -hmm. Where else did they do this? Oh yes, Butler, Pennsylvania. Oh, you were a witness to the crime? Go home. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Oh, there's blood on the roof. Get that washed off. We'd hate to have someone come in contact with human blood. Yeah, burn well, that body. Burn the body. <laughs> Unreal. Uh, you know, and, and these are the same people, uh, you know, going after Trump are now the ones put in charge of investigating uh, attempts on his life. It seems very odd that it would be the same organization. Yeah. And, you know, and it's the same one that set up the whole fake narrative against Trump and really doesn't do much of anything to really get the serious spies who have infiltrated our society. Yeah. Um, You know, the FBI talks about uh, doing everything they can to have safe and secure elections. I'm reading about Russia, China, Iran now trying to influence the U.S. election. I I don't know what's true anymore. Like I could see them definitely doing that. I could also see Democrats using that as a narrative. How how do we figure out what is the truth with election interference from foreign nations? Well, first of all, we, we should assume that as the largest, most powerful democracy in the world, all the bad guys are going to be targeting us to influence our elections first to elect candidates beneficial to them. So who would that be? Communist China, Iran, Russia, Cuba, Venezuela. You never hear the FBI talking about Venezuelan attempts to influence our elections when a certain software used in in a huge number of our election machines was commissioned by the Venezuelan government to flip an election in Venezuela to keep Hugo Chavez in as dictator through democratic means. So it's the, it's the, it's the source code on that same software that's operating on so many of the American electoral systems, including places like Georgia, for the purposes of flipping elections. But you never see the FBI talk about that regime, which is the one emptying its prisons into here, also being behind the company that's provided the voting software here. Something's really wrong when this this big uh, black hole is not even mentioned in any of our federal law enforcement or election security authorities. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. I mean, right now the Venezuelan presidency is in question because they're saying Maduro uh, rigged the election in order to stay in power. And, and now they're going back and forth. Um, But yes, yeah, you're, you're, you're right. Um, Of course, other countries would want to influence, but, Also, at the same time, that gave Hillary Clinton a really great cover story with her invented dossier in order to try to make Donald Trump look like he was some kind of Russian spy or or, or a compromised Russian asset. Yeah, it makes you wonder what kind of diversion are they have they created to make us look at Russia, which first Russia has been mucking around in our elections for 100 years. Since the 1924 elections. So it's no shocker. Hillary never, and the Democrats never objected to it until it was Hillary's turn. And then you had Angela Davis, the Soviet asset, 
East German train gets on Putin's RT television in June of 2020 to say that she's not running, uh, the Communist Party's not running a candidate this year because they're all going to get behind Joe Biden because they could get more from him. Did you ever hear the Biden administration say anything or the FBI saying, hey, this is malign foreign influence that's trying to influence our elections from a old Soviet asset now on Putin's TV saying that they're getting behind Biden? They're not saying any of this, but it's all out there. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like they're like, oh, never trust anything coming out of Russia. Russia officially endorses Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. OK, well, we'll take that one. Uh, you know, it's like they, they they have endorsed Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Why? Because they see them as weak, feckless leaders that they can take advantage of uh, versus a strong leader like they they went up against with Donald Trump in the past. Yeah. Yeah. Putin endorsed Biden three times. This year. And then when Biden was pushed aside, he came out and said very nice things about Harris. What does that say? No. He's it's never it's said the same thing about Trump. He's <laughs> and, and But so you, you dismissed, well, Putin wasn't really serious or he was only joking or whatever. Yeah, he was laughing at the at the at the sick ridiculousness of our system right now. But he, he wasn't joking about his support for uh, for Harris. Yeah. He said this repeatedly, despite Biden Harris's support for Ukraine, because it's not really threatening Putin's um, strategic goals the way Trump would. The, the, the Russians want American leaders who are predictable, who are known quantities. They need to plan carefully ahead, and especially the Chinese, even more so. They need to plan carefully ahead. They don't like wild cards at all. And Trump, even for his best friends, is a complete wild card. He's the worst thing in the world for a hostile foreign leader because those hostile foreign leaders can't plan against him. Yeah. Michael, have you seen the new Reagan movie? Not yet. Oh, it, it's it's fantastic. In there, I don't want to give away the, the main thing, but in there, Russia was tracking Ronald Reagan for almost 30 years because they worried that he could become president and threaten the United or threaten the USSR, uh, and then and then look what he ends up doing, right? Like it falls, they bring down the wall. Uh, but in the movie, they prove that they literally had spies tracking him for decades uh, because he was a wild card. Same thing with Donald Trump. Yeah, he's, he's yeah he was a Democrat anti-communist who testified before Congress about Soviet and communist infiltration of Hollywood. So he was a danger even before he ran for governor of California. So this is what our foreign adversaries do. They map our politicians and other political figures and they track them early in their careers to see how they can influence public opinion, influence them, influence those around them to prevent them from getting elected or taking power, and if they are elected, to prevent them from executing their agendas that would be harmful to their interests. So the, the, the Soviets did it, the Russians do it, the Chinese do it, all the bad guys do it. Yeah, it's 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 bizarre just as a normal citizen to think about that. But then, you know, I get this message from Larry Johnson, who is former CIA, that comes on the show, and he lets me know, hey, be careful. You're on Volodymyr Zelensky's death list uh, for telling the truth about the Russia-Ukraine war. Uh, maybe don't maybe don't head to Ukraine. Uh, you know they're going after journalists, and I'm like, oh my gosh! Like I'm just a, a a small fish in a very big pond, and yet they are aware of me and my YouTube channel uh, to the point where I'm now on the kill this guy list uh, over in Ukraine. Wow. Well. Yeah. Congratulations. I'm not on it. <laughs> Gosh. I don't know how to take that as like, okay, you're a truth teller, therefore you're dangerous, or um, or just the fact that like I I, you know, somebody's aware of me and may want to kill me. Uh both are both are uh, mixed emotions that way, right? <laughs> well, you know, it, it it reassures you that you really do matter. You know, sometimes yes. no matter what level you get to, even in the in 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 the you know national office or whatever, you still wonder, is it really worth it? Am I making a difference at all? So when, when you get on a death list of a foreign government, you're making a difference. Yeah. 
uh, well, it's nice to know someone's thinking about me. Um, you know, it's like uh, they say uh, the auto auto warranty. People are always thinking about you. And now I have, I guess, Zelensky and his government thinking about me. So that that's nice. Um, speaking of Ukraine, um, I'm reading today that Europe is likely funding this war for Russia to attack Ukraine in the form of they need affordable energy. They don't have energy resources. And so they have been quietly, privately, secretly, whatever word you want to use, buying oil out of India and India is getting it out of Russia. So they're basically funding this war for Vladimir Putin against Ukraine. But then with their words, they say, we support Ukraine against Putin. But yeah. when it comes to the money trail, they're the ones funding it. Have you have you seen anything about that? Oh, oh Europe excels at virtue signaling. They, they pioneered it. They did it before we did it. And as long as it looks good to them and to the people around them, and as long as they can be trendy and cool, it's fine. It doesn't matter. Uh, what it really is. So here they're, they're, you know, they're the ones who are take, wagging the American dog on Ukraine. By the way, I, I support, I support Ukraine's right to self-defense. I just don't support dragging the United States into somebody else's war when we don't have a defense treaty with them. But that, that point being aside, if the Europeans are so intent on defeating Russia in Ukraine, why are they buying so much Russian oil? That's refined in not only India, but Turkey. So once it's refined into gasoline from those third countries, then the Europeans are fine buying it and they save five or 10% on it. Yeah. Which means it's, it's just their typical cynicism, their typical lack of believing in anything and their virtue signaling that, oh, we're big fighters against Putin. We're not buying Russian oil. Well, yes, they are. And they are financing Putin's war machine against Ukraine. Wow. Yeah. It's kind of like um, when the casinos stopped letting you gamble with real money and you, you had to put it on a card, right? A hotel card. It's just one step removed away from money. Therefore, it's less addictive, right? Yeah. Um, it's not real here. money. We're, yeah. we're not buying their oil. We're just buying gas from Turkey and India, which happens to come from them. So, but th those countries are making a fortune being the middleman. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Everybody profits from big wars. Yeah. Okay. Um, wanted to get your, <laughs> I want to get your thoughts on uh, Israel now attacking Hezbollah uh, when we all thought that they were just fighting Hamas. Uh, then today I read how uh, all these attacks from Hezbollah up north, uh, Hezbollah is now hiding weapons among civilians and apartment complexes just like Hamas in order to throw off Israel and their ability to defend themselves. What What is your thought on the current state of the war? Are they going to continue to try to take out Hamas or are they more distracted by the bigger enemy, which is Iran and Hezbollah? Well, it's possible to have more than one enemy. And when all those enemies are aligned with each other and they're coordinated with each other, you have to fight them all. The Israel did a really great job of, uh, of destroying Hamas's infrastructure and its ability to really wage a coherent fight. And they did it despite intense U.S. pressure from the United States to go easy on Hamas. I mean, can you imagine if Israel had followed U.S. pressure and done a unilateral or, or, or an instant ceasefire with Hamas? Months ago, can you imagine how strong Hamas would be today and how much more empowered Iran and Hezbollah would be today because of that? So the Hezbollah aspect of the war came really after Hamas was was pretty wiped out. And it wasn't the Israelis that, that initiated against Hamas. It was Hamas that said, OK, we're part of this war effort, too, as with Iran, as with the, the Houthis in Yemen and elsewhere. So Israel has has done brilliant, brilliant work hitting Hamas in Lebanon with without doing the civilian damage that a normal war would would cause. Uh, if you just think of the of, of those of those beepers, uh, the the brilliance of getting all those explosives implanted in all those beepers at whatever foreign factory or distribution center that they were done in, 
specifically so that Hamas or the Iranians would order them for all Hamas personnel and then, and then distributing it the way they did. They didn't use artillery and aircraft that would kill innocent civilians to do it. They just blew up the Hamas operatives and command structure with those beepers and then with the walkie talkies and so forth. So then when it's time to go in, I'm sorry, that was Hezbollah, not Hamas. Uh, so then when it's time to go in and actually get the serious weaponry after blinding and cutting up the command and control of Hezbollah, they lo they geolocated into the exact floors of residences where Hezbollah had been renting space from the private owners of these buildings to, to have them as arsenals, fuel depots, and drone hangars. And then the Israelis did something really unusual, which was to get the imagery of those buildings prior to them being targeted, put up the schematics to show where the drones and other weapons were being stored, and then to show the the their own forces coming in and attacking those sections of the buildings that contain those weapons. And then you can see all the secondary and tertiary explosions coming out of it. So it was a brilliant operation on the Israeli side to to pull out the the, the you know practically everything Hezbollah has, and then knocking off their leaders. Now the Iranians are being left without the proxy to fight their war against Israel. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I read about this whole thing going, my gosh, this seems like a Tom Cruise Mission Impossible uh, movie scenario, like getting thousands of pagers to explode at the same time. Then they're, they're finally, you know, like getting through the medical stuff and then the walkie-talkies start exploding. Uh, but yeah, I, I, was, I saw some video this morning where Israel was able to target apartment complexes where they literally were storing like ammunition warehouses among children and families. And I hate to see that, but th this is what the, this is happening in this area is they hide behind families yeah. uh, in order to make, make their enemy not want to attack them. And yet they hit this building and then the building blows up for like another five or 10 minutes because it was a munitions warehouse within this apartment complex so this is not the end of the toolbox it should be very clear there are more tools to use the message is a simple one we will deal with anyone who threatens the citizens of the state of israel in the north in the south also in more distant places we finally after a long period of preparation started to realize these capabilities in lebanon this attack was also planned for a long time it was carried out at the right time in a very sharp manner and now we are moving on to prepare the next things in a very sharp way as well. Yeah, tell us more about what's coming out of Israel, Maria. Well, hello to you, Yunan. Let me start with the situation here where I am right now, some 30 to 40 kilometers away from the border with Lebanon. Lebanon is that way. And I have to say that the situation here is far from calm. Starting early hours of Saturday, residents across northern and central Israel have been shaken by anti-missile sirens signaling incoming threats. And we hear from the army that at least 10 projectiles have crossed into Israel from Lebanon, including a surface-to-surface -surface ballistic missile, which the army reports was successfully intercepted by air defense. Here in Haifa, from time to time, we can hear loud booms and see the white trails left by the Israeli anti-missile system in the skies. And this time, I have to say, the attacks have impacted hundreds of communities and towns extending to the West Bank, or the area that Israel refers to as Samaria, Judea and Samaria by its biblical name. In a video circulating online, interceptions are heard and seen over Ramallah, the main city of the Palestinian administration. While there is no information on casualties or serious injuries, some property damage has been reported. And we hear that several people required medical assistance, primarily due to the injuries that people got while rushing to bomb shelters. Just to remind you, on Monday, the IDF launched Operation Nar Northern Arrows in Lebanon, aiming to destroy Hezbollah's combat capabilities. And the army reports having targeted hundreds of locations across Lebanon, destroying arms depots and ammunition storages. They have also targeted senior Hezbollah leadership, claiming to have killed the group's top 20 commanders. Earlier on Saturday, as you know, they announced the assassination of Hassan Nasrallah, the leader of Hezbollah, who has been at the helm of the militant group for over 30 years. You heard about that attack.
back from my colleague in Beirut. And this is seen, of course, as a significant success for the Israeli army. And for Netanyahu personally, who was politically buried no long time ago, this marks, of course, a victorious rehabilitation. However, the ongoing sirens that we keep hearing here and residents of central Israel keep hearing as well indicate that the threat from his from that side from Lebanon remains very real. I have to say that Israelis are all too familiar with rockets, especially this last year after Hezbollah joined Hamas in confronting uh, Israel last October. But are they truly that secure? And here's my report on the options available to Israeli citizens in the time of bombardment. When the sirens go off, warning of incoming threats, rockets, missiles or drones, every second counts. People rush. Where to? In this video, you can see me and hundreds of Israelis who were participating in a massive demonstration running towards a nearby concrete high-rise building to take shelter under its entrance. Another time, an underground parking garage becomes people's choice for survival. While it does provide refuge, these are not actual shelters. We are in Haifa, Israel's third largest city and the largest in the north. During the recent escalation, Hezbollah has repeatedly targeted the city for the first time since the Second Lebanese War in 2006, a dramatic turn of events for a city with a population of nearly 300,000 people. Facing the threat, residents are sheltering in the stairwell. What choice do we have? The nearest public bomb shelter is about 15 minutes walk. But we don't have 15 minutes, we have only one. In our flat, there is no bomb shelter. In our building, there is no bomb shelter. And as far as I know, none of my friends who live in this district has nothing. Our staircase looks very reliable. It worked well. People tried to cheer up each other. And I didn't feel so much fear, you know. It looks like people's spirits are helping them face the threat head on, not shelters. That same spirit is driving locals to stay put. Everywhere there are bombardments. Yesterday half Haifa was bombarded, tomorrow a lot will be bombarded. No, I don't think it can be a solution right now. Many, however, decided to leave, especially those in the border area. With government assistance, around 62,000 people were relocated, while nearly the same number left on their own, effectively turning northern communities into a no-man's land. Ensuring their safe return has become a primary goal of Israel's extensive bombardment of Lebanon. Our policy is clear. We continue to deliver powerful strikes against Hezbollah. We will not stop until we achieve all our goals. First of all, the safe return of the inhabitants of the north to their homes. And Hezbollah will retaliate. Israel has developed an extensive network of bomb shelters, ranging from private residences to community shelters designed for public use, one might think. But that's not exactly true, even for a city like Haifa, which faces a high risk of attacks. This is the entrance of the shelter. We meet Haifa's deputy mayor in the city's largest district, home to 60,000 residents. This is the old one. Most of our shelters is like this. He takes us to one of the public shelters and I ask him how many there are in the area. More than 20. 20? More than 20. For 60,000 uh, For 60,000, yes. We, we know that uh, it's not enough, but we arrange uh, some uh, parking. You will not need a public shelter if you have a so-called safe room at home. Lined with reinforced walls and a sealed door, it is designed to protect residents from conventional weapons. Since the 1990s, contractors have been obliged by law to include a safe room in every new apartment built. But Haifa is an old city. About 50% uh, of our population have a safe room and 50% uh, uh, will need the shelters. And we're talking about population of around 200 about, uh, yes, 290,000 people. Access to shelters is crucial. It's advanced technology and we open it from the command center of our city. Remotely? Remotely, yes. 
But now it's open 24-7. Now it's open 24-7, yes. Suddenly my phone starts vibrating. It is a rocket alert okay, app. come inside. Now we have notification about uh, any rockets coming. Can we don't hear the sirens because the area under attack is 30 minutes away. Since Monday, Hezbollah has launched more than 400 projectiles toward Israel, according to the IDF. There have also been rockets and drones from Iraq and Yemen. This time, it's not Haifa in the line of fire. It's a good thing we are filming near the shelter. It's a very good shelter. 20 stairs down, we found ourselves in a well-equipped bunker. Four meters underground. There is a air condition, there is a water, there is a Wi-Fi generator for the emergency. Hezbollah recently launched a ballistic missile aimed at the headquarters of the Israeli Foreign Security Service in Tel Aviv. It was intercepted and no damage has been reported, but what if it hadn't been? What kind of threat this shelter can protect you from? Uh, all the rockets that uh, Hezbollah uh, uh, has. Like if it's surface to surface, ballistic? Yes, everything. The one they launched uh, recently? To everything, Tel Aviv. everything, yes. Even if it's a direct hit? Yes. We are in a room about three to four meters underground that can barely accommodate the dozens of people. Between uh, 60 and 100 people. Every shelter uh, is uh, unique. And uh, What's this. The I think it's about uh, 200, maybe 300 people. I do the math. If the largest shelter in this area can hold up to 300 people and there are around 20 of them, then no more than 6,000 people can be secured. It gets dark when we leave the shelter. There are rockets again, but they're far from us. We only see an Israeli anti-missile system in action, intercepting rockets coming from Lebanon. This bomb shelter in Haifa is one of many built a year or two after the state of Israel was established. It's seen decades of conflicts, and today, more than 70 years on, it stands not just a relic of past challenges, but as a stark reminder of ongoing tensions. With a full-scale war with Hezbollah looming, the key question is whether these shelters in Haifa, in other northern communities and throughout the country will be enough to save so many lives. Marie Fenoshina, RT, reporting from Haifa. Okay, so that was the video, and uh, there were some other takeaways from that video that I didn't show you, and that's why I encourage you to go back and watch the whole thing. Uh, you know, we can't be certain about anything. You see how I come at it from both sides and you make up your own damn mind? That's called free speech, people. That's called free speech. And then uh, one of the things they did go into in the video, and I didn't show you, was they were talking about how Mayorkas is a uh, Cuban communist uh, and that this whole mass migration uh, that's taking place in the United States is intentional. And it's meant to destroy the United States because Mayorkas is a traitor and he's working for foreign influence. Probably Venezuela. Uh, I'm sure he's got, got Cuban influences, maybe China. Uh, so, you know, but somehow they've gotten control of the United States government. And if you watch the part on the election that was talking about foreign influence and how they buy our, all our politicians and it's a hundred year project, that's why I wanted to show you the whole thing. So we know that foreign interests are in control of the government right now in the United States and they will destroy us. Uh, and they're doing it intentionally. So anyway, uh, the last thing is uh, we're just going to finish up. Right? Oh, yeah. They talked about also how the Venezuelan gangs, uh, these people coming across are the worst of the worst. They're even worse than the El Salvadorian gangs. And the Democrats and the CIA and the deep state are working with them to terrorize uh, you and me. Uh, and, and that's how another uh, communist tactic uh, of how they're going to cower all of us into our houses, uh, you know, whatever, it's, it's, it's terrible. Uh, and then uh, we're just going to finish off. One last tip before I hang up here was when they put the washing machine in, they just popped those bolts right out of the door in my garage. I actually locked the door to my garage because they, they'd have to, it, it opens to the garage. And so you can't, you know, I figured, well, they can't break that door down. They don't have to, man. You just, they took them bolts out in two minutes. 
And then you just slide, I mean, even if you got a dead bolt, you just slide that door right off and it's, you know, it's, it's out of the way. Think about that. So now I got to come up and when I find out, I, I got to come up with a solution to cover up those hinges so that you can't get to them in two minutes. Because <laughs> if they get in my garage, they're in my house in two minutes. Uh, which might be a good thing if I'm laying on the floor calling 911. You never know how life might work. Uh, this is uh, Israeli tanks on the Lebanon border. Looks like they're going in. Regional war in the Middle East, baby. Peace out. Stay free.